Uh, everybody, I'm uh, Alain Combe. I have the privilege to uh, have uh, this uh, tutorial with you. Uh, so first, uh, the purpose of a tutorial uh, is to be practical. Uh, so uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime uh, if you have questions uh, about the slides or about the management. Uh, my talk is, let's say, uh, 20, 25 minutes, so uh, we will have some time at the end uh, for your questions. Uh, it's the other way of uh, also uh, proceeding and uh, uh, answering any question you might have. So this is first my uh, disclosures uh, here. So uh, first, uh, what is uh, a severe uh, pulmonary embolism? Uh, we have very nice papers. Uh, I will show you two or three major papers you should have. Uh, they, most of them are free of access. Uh, these are the uh, Urban Society of Cardiology guidelines, uh, which are revised every uh, five or six years. Those were published in 2020, so we may have some new uh, guidelines next year. Uh, but they are very well written, and there is a lot of information in those guidelines. And of course, uh, there is uh, data uh, and uh, 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 information about the classification here. So it's still uh, 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 classified uh, as uh, uh, defining risks of mortality from low here in green to intermediate, which has two uh, classes, high, low and high, and high uh, risk of death. And you will see in the next slide that even in that category, a uh, patient might be subclassified into those with catastrophic versus non-catastrophic uh, pulmonary embolism. So, we are going to talk here of severe PE, so it's basically patients who have high risk. Most of these, they have classified as high risk because they have hemodynamic instability. And we'll see in the next slide what is hemodynamic instability. And when there is hemodynamic instability, usually there is also uh, uh, clinical signs and echo cardiographic signs of severe right ventricle dysfunction and cardiac troponin might not be elevated because uh, this might have been no time enough for them to increase uh, and the clinical parameters I will show you a scoring system but clearly they might not apply uh, to those most, most uh, severe forms. So now what is the definition of hemodynamic instability which classes a patient at high risks? Uh, from, from the beginning. There are three criteria here, and one of these uh, is enough uh, to uh, uh, classify the patient as a high-risk patient. Of course, two of them, number one and number two, may be considered as uh, close to catastrophic. Of course, the first one is catastrophic, the patient had cardiac arrest. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, systolic blood pressure, which remains uh, below 90, which is the classical threshold for shock, uh, or the need uh, for vasopressors uh, to maintain uh, this uh, uh, systolic uh, blood pressure. And because of its shock, uh, the patient will have signs of an organ perfusion. This is exactly the same definition which is used also for cardiogenic shock, for septic shock here. Uh, there might be an uh, 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 altered mental status, there might be a skin uh, also which might be clammy, mottling, uh, etc., oliguria, anuria, or increase in serum lactate. Those are the classical signs of shock. Once again, they are just the same uh, for cardiogenic shock. And the last one uh, is uh, maybe a little bit less uh, 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 severe, it's persisting. Uh, systolic blood pressure below 90 uh, or a drop of more than 40 uh, meters of mercury uh, uh, from the usual uh, uh, blood pressure of the patient lasting more than 15 minutes and not caused by arrhythmia, hypovolemia or sepsis. So uh, those patients have hypertension. Hypertension may respond to treatment, but they had hypertension, so it's enough here uh, to qualify hemodynamic instability. So this is what I've told you just before. Uh, of those high-risk patients, there might be a subclassification between massive, those who have RE dysfunction plus hypertension, who are clearly at high risk, and the catastrophic uh, class, patients who have the most severe shock, cardiac arrest, high lactate, 
uh, and signs of uh, inadequate uh, uh, perfusion, uh, mostly skin or uh, brain uh, 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 problems. Just for you to know, uh, those are the uh, uh, severity index system uh, which might uh, at the ICU admission or the emergency room admission also help qu classify the patient. But for those very severe patients, I, I believe that uh, these uh, uh, simple or uh, complete uh, primary uh, umbilical severity index, the PESI, uh, might not be adapted. Once again, uh, those are uh, the uh, uh, factors and uh, characteristics that I just showed you before that are uh, at the highest uh, risk. So let's move on now and uh, uh, to uh, define what is the pathophysiology uh, of uh, this severe disease. And this is the classical vicious circle uh, leading from uh, PE uh, to uh, uh, severe shock. Uh, at the beginning, it's an increase uh, in the, uh, of the afterload, which is going to uh, increase the uh, pressures within the right ventricle was going to dilate. Uh, and uh, when the, uh, the right ventricle dilates, it's going to compress uh, the left ventricle within the pericardium, which in the end uh, will also lead to a decrease in cardiac output. And this vital circle uh, will cause uh, a drop in systemic blood pressure and also uh, a decrease in the perfusion of all vital organs. Uh, leading to uh, <clears throat> less uh, oxygen delivery. And at the end, uh, this uh, uh, vicious circle uh, is uh, leading to a massive obstructive shock uh, uh, and death. And uh, this is also a diagram which is known for years now, uh, which plots uh, the severity uh, uh, in terms of mortality, percentage of mortality, and uh, the increase in the pulmonary artery pressure, the systolic pressure might be also the systemic vascular resistance as a function of uh, the uh, severity of the percentage of uh, PA occlusion here. And as you can see, uh, it's well tolerated by the right ventricle for a very long time. Uh, because of the compliance uh, of the right ventricle, which dilates uh, because of the increase in LV, uh, right ventricle afterload. And there is a breaking point, uh, which is usually between 30 and 50% of complete obstruction of the pulmonary arteries, above which there is RV dilation, which translates then in shock and then in cardiac arrest if the occlusion is over a 70 to 80%. So, Within a minor increase in the percentage of uh, PA occlusion, uh, there's going to have here a major increase in the systemic, uh, in the systolic pulmonary artery pressure, which will lead uh, to uh, this uh, catastrophic uh, shock. Uh, and of course, uh, as I've told you from the beginning, uh, this occlusion of the pulmonary arteries are going to increase the right ventricle afterload, the systemic vascular resistance are increased, the pressure is increased, and the consequence on the right ventricle is a dilation uh, of uh, the right ventricle. So Doppler echocardiography is critical here uh, to evaluate uh, the severity of the disease, uh, and it should be obtained as soon as possible. If there is an immediate access uh, to a CT scan, an angio CT scan, well, might also be useful to do it. It should not delay uh, treatment, especially in the most severe forms, uh, those patients who have shock or who had uh, uh, cardiac arrest with ROSC. Those patients should be treated immediately uh, based on the data of uh, the uh, echo. And those are the classical criteria uh, of uh, the ECHO. Once again, uh, this figure is uh, from the uh, uh, latest guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology, very well uh, written, and summarizing all the criteria uh, which you may have uh, on uh, uh, the ECHO, some from uh, top to bottom, left to right. Of course, the first uh, 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 adaptation mechanism of the right ventricle is to dilate. And uh, uh, when the dimension uh, of the right ventricle becomes greater uh, than the dimension, the diastolic dimension of the left, when the ratio is above one, here you have 
uh, uh, the first sign of severe uh, uh, RV afterload, uh, which is getting significant and which may have an impact on, on the patient. Uh, second, uh, uh, third um, uh, 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 figure here it's, uh, with a short axis view, uh, you might see also a flattening of the uh, septum, which is also a very good sign of the impact of the dilation of the, left, of the right ventricle onto the left ventricle here. Uh, the IVC will be dilated. Uh, you will have a significant tricuspid regurgitation. And the two last uh, at the bottom right here uh, are those who have also frequently uh, mentioned the TAPSI, uh, which is the uh, um, uh, uh, annular plane systolic excursion here uh, was very easily measured uh, with uh, uh, MMOD uh, 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 Doppler, uh, when it's below 16, usually it's over 16, over 20, and when it's below 16 millimeters, uh, it's a sign of uh, 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 important uh, RV dysfunction. Same for the measurement of the systolic tricuspid uh, plane velocity using tissue Doppler. Uh, you have those uh, uh, tissue Doppler features now on the, on the latest generation machines. And when this systolic velocity is below 9.5, this is also one of the criteria of severe uh, 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 RV dysfunction. Uh, there is a, a sign which is mentioned in B here uh, uh, with the uh, uh, apical far chamber view is the McConnell uh, uh, sign. The McConnell sign is the preservation of the systolic function of the, the apex, just the, the last mm, half a centimeter of the apex of the right ventricle. It's a very good sign of acute RV failure. Uh, this sign is not present in patients who have chronic uh, primary hypertension, but it's a very good sign of acute uh, RV uh, dysfunction, the McConnell sign. Uh, here you have images. Uh, uh, this is the subcostal view here. Uh, you can see uh, the, the liver and below the liver is the heart here. Uh, on the left panel, you have a flattening here uh, of the uh, uh, left ventricle with the dilation of the, uh, of the right. Uh, and same here uh, on the four chamber view, subcostal uh, view here. Or you have a very important dilation of the, of the right ventricle. So the outcomes now, uh, and once again, we are fortunate to have uh, very recent uh, papers. These papers were published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's uh, uh, based on a uh, large uh, registry, the PERT uh, consortium registry, close to 6,000 patients here. First information, uh, uh, there was one force of these patients who had a uh, high risk PE uh, as defined by the latest uh, guidelines. Uh, and high risk mostly defined by uh, hemodynamic collapse hypotension. And they were all also able to uh, identify the subgroup of patients with those who had catastrophic, who had high risk plus uh, hemodynamic collapse with the need for uh, vasopressors or uh, uh, cardiac arrest with or without the need for CPR. Uh, the number of patients, of course, were much less uh, for those patients who had the most uh, severe form, those catastrophic PE, but still was 3.5%. Uh, uh, outcome data of these uh, very large series of patients. First, on the top panel here, you have the use of advanced therapies, including uh, the devices that we'll talk to you about at the end of this talk. Uh, there was no difference actually in the percentage of patients with high risk or catastrophic uh, PE uh, uh, having uh, this uh, device deployed. Uh, but when looking at the uh, mortality uh, rate, it was obviously much higher for catastrophic PE uh, and it was 42 versus 17. So this clearly has a major impact on the uh, outcome of those patients. So now what to deal with these patients, and uh, we are going back to the guidelines. Uh, once again, the recent guidelines uh, for high-risk severe PE. So we have three class one recommendations. So it means that you need to do it. It's green here. Uh, anticoagulation with infraction aparin uh, using uh, a weight adjusted bolus is indicated. It is recommended. You have to do it. Level one, although the level of evidence is uh, uh, still low. Systemic thrombolytics therapy is also recommended. Uh, a class one recommendation. You need to do it uh, with a level of uh, evidence, which is B. 
And there is a, a steel. Uh, I do believe this will change uh, in coming years, but it, there is still a class one recommendation for surgical lumbolectomy uh, for patients with high risk PE in whom thrombolysis is contraindicated or has failed. Uh, this is not the strategy I'm using now in my center for most patients with this type of uh, 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 indication, but we will discuss that in a minute. The second recommendation is not a class one, it's a 2A. 2A means that uh, it's labeled as should be considered and uh, the setup of a PERT team, a multidisciplinary team and program for the management of high risk and, uh, and intermediate risk PE should be considered depending of course on the resources and the expertise which is available uh, in each hospital. Uh, so there is low level of evidence but uh, 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 some uh, uh, data from retrospective registries uh, showing that this initiative, this is the same for the shock team also uh, for cardiogenic shock, uh, it helps. Here the team will be uh, 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 constituted of uh, interventional cardiologists, radiologists, surgeons, uh, 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 and of course us, uh, the ICU doctors. Uh, the PER team should be alerted as soon as possible uh, when there is a case and discuss the different types of uh, strategies and, and indications might be medical catheter based, surgical embolectomy or uh, VA ECMO as uh, we will see. And those are uh, the other recommendations here. Uh, the percutaneous catheter based director treatment should be considered uh, for patients with high risk P in whom thrombolysis is contributed or has failed. This is only a 2A. Uh, while the surgical lumbolectomy has a one. I slightly disagree uh, with that recommendation. I think both of them should have the same level of a, a recommendation. Norepinephrine and dobutamine should be considered in patients with high risk PE. Of course, those patients are dying of shock, uh, uh, time for initiation of treatment, and this should be a class one uh, here. Uh, there is very little evidence from uh, the literature. If a patient is dying of uh, hypertension, refractory shock, uh, you would not randomize norepinephrine versus placebo. Uh, the patient received norepinephrine. Uh, same for dobutamine. So there will never be RCTs in that situation. But for me, it's a class one recommendation. If the patient is dying of shock, he should receive norepinephrine plus dobutamine. It's obvious here. And ECMO may be considered uh, so it's a 2B. Here we're getting down in the level of evidence uh, in combination with surgical embolectomy or catheter-based uh, in patients with PE and refractory collapse or cardiac arrest. So here is the catastrophic form of, uh, of PE. Uh, once again, this is the first time uh, ECMO appears in the PE guidelines. Uh, and the, 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 the guidelines before was pub were published in 2015. There was no mention of ECMO. Now it is mention of ECMO. And you will see in years, uh, the uh, uh, recommendation will increase. And uh, I do believe in a couple of years from now, it's going to be a class one uh, for catastrophic PE. And we'll discuss that in a minute. Uh, third paper uh, you should uh, have in your uh, bibliography is this one, published in Intensive Care Medicine uh, just a few weeks ago. And it's a, a very beautiful uh, review paper uh, uh, on high risk uh, in intermediate risk uh, PE in the ICU, a lot of formation, the latest uh, information uh, uh, um, uh, and also beautiful algorithm and, uh, uh, about the management. So this is the main figure of that paper and we will take some time to go through it uh, because it's here a summary of what you should do uh, in the context of uh, uh, severe uh, preliminary embolism. So I will develop. There is here in the middle the pathophysiology, just what I've showed you before, the, this visual circle here leading to uh, 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 circulatory shock and, and death. And there are six great uh, uh, um, uh, strategies you should discuss and uh, 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 provide to the patient. Of course, the first one should be removal of the clots uh, because those patients are dying of uh, an obstruction, a massive obstruction of the uh, uh, primary arteries. So the first choice is still uh, systemic fibrinolysis. Uh, an alternative might be catheter-based or surgical uh, embolectomy. 
the objective here is to salvage the patient, to decrease RV afterload. Uh, for thrombolytics, this may be risk of bleeding, specifically uh, brain bleeding, and there may be also a pressure, especially surgical embolectomy, although the surgeon will tell you that it's a, a benign uh, operation, still it's ternotomy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, they, they say that in my... Uh, department. It's, it's, it's a very simple uh, operation. Still, uh, you need bypass um, uh, for uh, might last uh, half an hour, uh, up to one hour. So, it, and there might be complications after these types of surgeries. Second, you need to deliver oxygen uh, to the patient uh, very rapidly. Uh, if the patient has severe shock, you may deliver oxygen, but it would not never reach uh, the organs because of, of shock. Uh, the first line is, of course, the high flu or um, nasal oxygen, which is very powerful now. Beware of intubation. Uh, intubation might lead to uh, cardiac arrest uh, in a matter of uh, a few seconds because uh, you're going to increase the pressure uh, within the thorax uh, during uh, intubation, not to mention the drugs you may use uh, for crush sedation here. Uh, which might uh, lead to a massive vasodilation, uh, and you might just kill the patient uh, in a minute uh, when proceeding to uh, nasal intubation. So if the patient needs to be intubated, it's a cardiac arrest, there's no discussion. But if you think about intubating the patient, you should have everything ready uh, and probably an ECMO machine not far away uh, if, if needed. So now, treating shock. How to improve... Uh, the uh, uh, RV function and the patient is uh, uh, hypertensive, what is the drug of choice. So as for all other form of shock, septic shock, cardiogenic shock, it's dobutamine plus norepinephrine, which has two drugs, uh, which are uh, the drugs of uh, choice for uh, that strategy. Uh, dobutamine will increase RV inotropy, the coupling of uh, the right ventricle and primary artery will increase also the uh, global cardiac output. These drugs have many side effects. It increases the consumption of oxygen of, of the heart. Uh, it may, it's a vasodilator, it's a ninodilator, so it's increasing uh, the inotropy of the heart, both the right and the left ventricle, but also dilates uh, the artery. So uh, there is a need to use it in combination with norepinephrine uh, because uh, it might actually aggravate uh, hypertension. And uh, uh, it's also an, a, a drug which might lead to uh, uh, severe uh, ventral arrhythmia uh, and tachycardia. Uh, there may be a need for slight volume optimization. Never talk about fluid loading here. Uh, it's RV optimization, uh, loading optimization, and usually there might be an improvement with 250 to up to 500 ml of uh, uh, saline here uh, to optimize uh, the uh, RV preload, uh, this major def uh, increase in the RV afterload, and uh, if the RV preload is optimized, the patient might uh, be a bit better off. Systolic, uh, systemic uh, blood pressure is reduced. The patient has hypertension because of the compression of the uh, uh, left ventricle by the right ventricle. So uh, once again, the drug of choice here is norepinephrine uh, to increase uh, 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 the um, uh, systemic pressure, uh, to increase perfusion of the organs, uh, and to improve uh, RV function. This drug has also some uh, inotropic effect on both uh, ventricles. But as any uh, uh, vasopressor and catecholamine, uh, those drugs have many side effects, uh, in including uh, tachyarrhythmia. And six, number six of the uh, different types of strategy uh, is for those patients who have the most severe forms, and uh, those who have refractory uh, RV failure, uh, the device of shock uh, of choice is VA uh, ECMO, uh, which may be used as a bridge either uh, to recovery without any type of other uh, types of treatment or in combination with other treatment. I will show, that, show you that in a minute. So just a few words now of the latest generation catheter-based therapies because they have become now more and more uh, available in uh, our uh, um, department and hospitals. Uh, they received a, a, a 2A, uh, once again, uh, recommendation in the latest guidelines from the uh, ESC. So uh, it means that it's written that uh, 
uh, uh, they uh, should be considered. So you need to discuss with your uh, radiologist, because most of these uh, procedures are made by uh, interventional radiologists here. It may be catheter-based thrombolysis, delivering thrombolytics uh, just uh, at the level of the clots in the primary arteries. Uh, it may allow you to decrease uh, the doses of um, RTPA, which is used, uh, and uh, it increase and improve uh, the uh, efficacy uh, of the drug by delivering just at the level where the clots uh, are located. Uh, this may be just simple catheter-based uh, 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 thrombolytics delivery, or it might be also some other forms of uh, mechanical um, pressures, uh, like fragmentation uh, of uh, uh, the, 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 the clots uh, or uh, aspiration of the clots. So there's many, many devices available. New devices are coming to the market uh, uh, all the time. Uh, for now, just small case series. We need more uh, with those uh, uh, devices. Uh, is it uh, worth doing it for severe cases uh, when it's available immediately uh, in place of uh, thrombolytics, uh, systemic thrombolytics, this, this might be, but we need clearly uh, more on, on that. And then we have VA ECMO 2B recommendation, as mentioned uh, just uh, a few minutes uh, ago. Why uh, VA ECMO works? Uh, VA ECMO drains the blood from the right side, uh, from uh, the right uh, atrium, and re-inject the blood countercurrent into uh, the uh, aorta. So it diverts the blood from the right ventricle, decreases the RV preload, and um, uh, uh, it's, it, it's the best solution here uh, for uh, having, uh, 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 preserving the function of the, of the uh, right ventricle and provide blood flow to the vital organs uh, and oxygen to the vital uh, organs. So uh, it's clearly needed in, ca in case of cardiac arrest. Uh, or uh, persisting cardiac arrest, what is called eCPR, ECMO for uh, CPR, or for those patients who have already had uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, in my opinion, it's also clearly needed for patients with catastrophic pulmonary embolism, uh, with the definition we uh, saw at the beginning of that talk. Uh, the question we have now, which is clearly unanswered, is that uh, when the patient has been uh, initiated an ECMO, uh, what's next? Uh, there's three solutions here. Just wait, put the patient on heparin, and wait. Usually, usually it takes one week, 10 days uh, for the clots to dissolve on just uh, conventional infraction heparin, and then you may remove uh, the ECMO device. This is something we're doing, let's say, five, 10 years ago. Second solution, go uh, to the uh, operating room uh, and ask the surgeon to remove the clots, okay. Third solution, uh, bring the patient to uh, the, the, the cat lab or the radiology lab uh, to uh, remove the clots. Uh, you may wait on ECMO. When the patient is on ECMO, uh, you have the restored perfusion of the organs. If the patient is in severe shock, you might wait at least one day, maybe two days, until going to the cat lab to remove the clots. Uh, and this is something uh, we uh, uh, now tend to do more and more frequently. I do not have data because this strategy is recent. Uh, we have performed five to six uh, uh, cases like that. Uh, usually the patient received thrombolytics initially because ECMO was not available and they were transferred to our unit on ECMO. And uh, then uh, we performed a CT and if there is a massive uh, uh, amount of clots remaining in the PA, uh, we may proceed to uh, uh, the cat lab to remove uh, most of the clots. And those guys, they are very good now at removing most of the clots, they are as, as good a surgeon uh, as removing all the clots without opening up uh, the chest. So this is a, a first series of patients we did uh, and published a couple of years ago now. Uh, those are very sick patients. Uh, close to 90% of those had cardiac arrest uh, before uh, getting VA. Uh, it's clearly maybe a bit too long uh, waiting here, and uh, there may be room for initiating ECMO uh, early on. Well, let's say pH was, uh, median pH was below 7 here, lactate uh, over 13. They were dead. Uh, they were clearly dead here. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, we rescued almost half of these patients uh, with uh, ECMO, and uh, at that time, 
uh, we just waited uh, for a, a spontaneous uh, dissolving of, of the clots. You can see here uh, the classical massive uh, uh, PE uh, in, in these patients and once again uh, the impact on, on the right ventricle. So a few uh, more recent uh, studies. This paper, uh, it's a French uh, multicenter series of 52 cases uh, which, well, showed that uh, with ECMO, the mortality was higher, but also the severity of the patients was quite higher. And especially uh, the mortality in that series of patients was less uh, for those who got surgical embolectomy. So it was a good paper for the surgeon. Uh, I think it was biased by indication. Uh, and uh, the mortality they have here uh, for cardiac arrest patients is close to 100%. And this is clearly not the case in the most recent series. I will show you the, this last one paper uh, of, uh, uh, on ECMO based on the large ELSO registry. First information, massive increase in the use of uh, ECMO for severe PE in recent years, uh, in the last decade here. Uh, more than 800 patients here. Uh, it's the largest uh, uh, series so far. Uh, types of support uh, was VA ECMO in 60% and uh, close to one third of the patients were uh, on cardiac arrest, persisting cardiac arrest when they received uh, uh, um, ECMO. 10% got VV. I do not think those patients were in uh, uh, catastrophic PE because VV is not uh, supporting the uh, uh, right ventricle or the left ventricle as well. Uh, so it's only oxygenating the blood and might not be enough here for the most severe form. So mortality, eCPR 70%, it's very high, expected as usual. Uh, but on VA, it was only 43%. Uh, so on average, both all of these patients, the mortality uh, was around 50 and not uh, 90 uh, as uh, in the latest uh, French uh, cohort. And those are the factors, serious mortality, classical factor here, uh, including uh, eCPR. Last point, uh, chronic uh, thromboembolic uh, uh, hypertension after PE. Uh, this is something which is known, uh, which occurs in uh, three to 5% of the patients and which occurs more frequently. Uh, this is the light last yellow line here, uh, when there is a high uh, percentage of occlusion of the pulmonary artery. So one question remain here uh, about uh, uh, that uh, 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 problem of uh, long-term uh, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension. Is the use of either surgical embolectomy or catheter-based embolectomy very early in the course of the disease will decrease the rate uh, of these uh, uh, disease uh, in the long run? Uh, this is another unanswered question. We have performed some CTs on you uh, uh, one month, two months after uh, putting a patient on VA uh, without proceeding to uh, uh, the emergency, the operating room or uh, the uh, catheter-based thrombectomy. And for most of these patients, there was no clots remaining uh, within the uh, primary uh, arteries. Last slide. Uh, is about uh, the uh, venous filter uh, recommendation and uh, for sure the routine use is not recommended. It's only for patients uh, with acute PE, absolute contraindication to uh, uh, anticoagulation or those uh, who have recurrence of PE uh, after a first uh, event. And uh, uh, this is my last slide, which is an invitation to uh, our meeting in Paris uh, at the end of June. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. And if you have some questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask. One, one, two quick questions. Yes, please go, go proceed. And we are, uh, the, mic, the mic is. Uh, I'd just like to, to ask what is your opinion in, in using milrinone instead of the butamine because of the effect on uh, lung vascularity? Uh, Levosimandan as well. Uh, those are drugs. Milrinone has an impact uh, which is probably a bit better uh, on the right side and might decrease a little bit more. Uh, the uh, uh, right side, uh, the primary resistance. There's no data. Uh, all of these um, I know dilators are inotropes and vasodilators, and their effect is, is very similar. Uh, Levosimandan is a bit different because it, it does not act through the same pathway. It just increases the sensitivity of uh, uh, the uh, 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 cardiac uh, filament uh, uh, to calcium and increase uh, the uh, inotropy uh, by this uh, mechanism. 
but there's very few data, and levosimadon is a, a highly hypertensive. Melanin is also a hypertensive drug, and it's been associated with more uh, arrhythmias uh, in the past uh, when compared head-to-head -head with dobutamine. So, uh, well, no data. Re latest recommendation is, with, is norepinephrine plus dobutamine. Make it simple. Well, uh, this is part of the uh, contraindications. Uh, it depends what types of surgery uh, and uh, if the uh, a place of surgery is accessible to a compression or a, a, a immediate treatment. And then you have the risk to benefit balance. But if it's a surgery with high risk of bleeding, which may compromise the life of the patient uh, uh, in a matter of um, minutes, it's clearly a contraindication. And then you have uh, all the other procedures you might just choose the local systemic uh, delivery with the catheter based, might be an option, or you might just put the patient on VA ECMO to salvage the patient and buy time. You can run a VA ECMO with limited doses of heparin for some time. Mm. I have a practical question. Thank you for your presentation. What is your therapeutic advice in case of the, after the fibronolysis, patient remain in shock status. So, so it's yeah, so clear it's indication for VA ECMO. Yeah, clear so, indication for VA ECMO. And when I ECMO not available? Why you repeat and when you repeat uh, fibrinolysis? So if you do not have access to ECMO within one half an hour, uh, you can do, well, uh, whatever is possible. Uh, you might just call a surgeon. Uh, he might have uh, done a period of six months uh, in cardiac surgery or uh, pulmonary surgery and might be able to open up the chest and uh, try to remove some of the clot. But the, 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 there is no option. The patient is dying. Uh, if it's failed uh, on thrombolytics, you might repeat, but by, you may also uh, significantly increase the risks of uh, uh, brain hemorrhage. Uh, if there is a catheter, you may try to put the catheter in place in the pulmonary artery and deliver uh, the uh, systemic thromb the thrombolytics within the pulmonary artery. But uh, this is the reason why we need to build networks. Uh, ECMO should be available now, um, let's say, uh, if possible, in a matter of 30 minutes. This is not a frequent um, disease, at least the, the, the is, P is a frequent disease, but the catastrophic forms, those who are failing on trouble, is not, it's not that frequent. <laughs>